Hey, how's it how's it going? One thumb, good, good, good. Photograph. Um, thank you, Lily, and everybody at Penn and everybody at the Strand. Have, has anyone been to this room before? Isn't it wild? Y'all volunteers and some folks working at the event. It's dope. I'm really excited to be reading around all these hallowed ass books in front of this illustrious audience. Um, but I feel like being around the, the halls of literature leads us toward quiet introspection and um, reverence, and I would rather not have that. So I'm gonna like do a little Instagram story where I'd like y'all to get like as live as fuck as you could possibly get in this space. You could like hoot and holler or just like cuss. All right, y'all ready? One, two, three. No, 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 I fucked it Wait, sorry, I fucked it up. Do it. We got to do it. We got to do it one more time. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> All right. That was it. All right, that, okay, that worked. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, oh, I got to set my timer. My fault. Very good. Um, oh, and also, I'm so excited to read with Gina Ann. She's a fucking giant in the work. You're not that tall, IRL. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm gonna read some poems from the, not from the book, and then a bunch from the book. Hi, Kyle, glad you're here. Um, this first one is about having a speech impediment. Anyone here got one, had one? You, me, and you. All right, this poem is for you, us three. <laughs> it's called Lisp. Um, it's a really nice turtleneck. Thank you, okay. Lisp. There are more S's in possession than I remembered. My name hinges on the S, is serpentine, has sibilance, is simple. Six-lettered, a symbol different from its sign. Sound shapes how we think about objects. The mouth shapes how sound spills out how the speaker is seen. Astigmatism is the homosexual mystique. My parents sought treatments. I was sent to a speech pathologist, sixth grade, a student, she gave me exercises. I was schooled, practiced silence, syllabics, syntax. My voice sap in the high branches. My voice a spoonful of sugared semen. I licked silk when I spoke. I spilt milk when I sang. When I sang, sick men tore wings from city birds, so I straightened my sound into a masculine eye. The S is derived from the Semitic letter Shin, meaning my swishiness is Hebraic, is inherited, it's semantic. No matter what was sacrificed, the tongued Isaac, a son against the stone of my soft palate still, I slipped my hand inside my neighbor's waistband and pulled back pincers. Sisyphus with the sissiest lips, parcel-tongued assassin, Sassy and passing for the poison sea. Now, when I say, please let me suck your cock, I sound straight as the still second hand on a dead watch. Well, thank you. Okay, that was me just saying the S sounds a bunch. Let's see if you can hear anything else. Um, okay, I'm gonna do one more new poem and then read some poems from the book. Um, has, has anyone here taken a photograph of your genitals and sent them to another person? <laughs> Not you, sir? <laughs> All right, I feel like that's the most folks in the room. Get with it. <laughs> um, okay, this is, this is for everyone else. This is called, I can't remember the last time I took a picture of my asshole. So it goes, or so I'm told. Blood thins as age grips you by your scruff and lifts. I was a plunderer once, was plundered often, made men thunder in my mouth, was digitized, a private eye was circumcised and well lit, the screen a scrim I'd lick to behold a new man upon the glass was to be held. To be besieged in that private theater was to be seen. To be seen was to be possessed. Blessed be the lust that comes without touch. That clean, filthy hygiene. How I trembled from three states away at the mere suggestion of his lips. To photograph your own whole is a feat of the human imagination. 
Oh, how far our species has come from fashioning axes from rock. What's become of us, I wonder, as I position my lamps? It's been, it's been too long since anyone new has looked at me, and my city is in flames, in flames, time again to spread and gape, one aperture opening into another, a hole so wide the whole awful world spills in. Dear God, I'm ready for my close-up. Thank you for the applause. Um, n none of these poems are fun. Those are my attempts at being funny. Um, these don't do that. Uh, I'll read the opening poem from the book. Uh, this collection sort of starts at the moment when uh, homosexuality was taken out of the DSM uh, in 1973, and it traces the sort of history of how pathology and pathologizing desire and the brain in general has led us to like a lot of the structural and internalized violences we experience today. Um, so this is the first poem in the book. Let's begin with the fields that line the roads my people fled down, trailed by soldiers, bullets at their heels. Oh, if those fields could speak, surely they'd stay silent. The coffle of us barefooted in winter, feet torn to rags by the graveled ice. I'd like to believe that spring grew nothing along the highways, that the flowers were not devastating in their beauty, but you can't blame biology for following its own logic. The professor's hand on the back of my neck that caused me to harden in my leather. The angel lust of hanged men, erections toward heaven. In America, you can't trust the flowers. They bloom despite themselves. They blood open, then fall. Thanks, Jean Ann. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, respond how you want. If it's a woof or a clap, that's cool. If it's like a quiet, internalized, deep appreciation of the work, that's also cool. <laughs> uh, okay, it call, wait, which one? All right, so I had an ex uh, who was uh, in conversion therapy as a child. And so this, there's a poem about that. It's called Sanctuary. My man was committed to an asylum as a child. Wild thing, fungal, phylum, virus. Thought they could fix him, that he could be fixed. His sickness too much, too much his diagnosis. Drugs and boys and language and boys and drugs. He was given a pill and made old. He was made cold in his skin. I try to place myself inside the conversion clinic when I touch his back as he sleeps. Baby queer with bangs hanged like men before his face, arms, a collision of scissor wars. And oh, the shower steam that rose behind him as his man, who was also a child and also committed, entered him for the first time between the shifts of the nurses took him raw in the open stall and the only salve of soap between them, blood. I enter him like this, brushing the bodies from his face, tasting the plastic restraints. Oh, thanks, John. Cool. I hadn't really thought about what I was gonna read. Oh, this is a ode to Kalanapin. <laughs> hey, okay. Let's make some noise for Kalanapin. <laughs> no, all right, okay. Kal it's called Kalanapin. <laughs> right. A doctor names the chemical imbalance in my brain and suddenly there's an infant wailing up there. I swear the cradle appeared concomitant with the diagnosis, a migraine white mobile whale. I say moderation is a red swamp I'm always bicycling toward. It recedes the more I believe in it. 
You say it's a simple swallowing and flood, the pram and arc afloat in the choking basement, angels slum in the aggregate gray matter as I wait for the sitter to finish smothering the child. When it's quiet, I name all the wet little rooms in my head after dead poets. I name the burst water pipes in the walls. I name the electricity. This is just to say I have eaten all the pills I've been prescribed and am nothing now. Forgive me. That's a sonnet. Make some noise for sonnet. <laughs> Very fun. OK. Um, I was sober for three years while living in the Bay, which a couple people know. Um, <laughs> Not in the Bay, in Austin. I was I, I overdosed in the Bay. That's the story. I overdosed on a bunch of codeine and whiskey. Um, and so this is a poem about that experience. Um, cool. It's called Warning, Red Liquid. Don't ask why I nearly emptied the saccharin flask. Opiates and homotropine testing my limits. You either love the world or you live in it. All my poems are wild birds pecking eye holes in the windows of hotels. In California, there are no seasons still. You find a way to feel sad all year round. Seasonless affective disorder, no one calls it but me just now. <laughs> Say cathedral and mean simply a building you take shelter behind to light a cigarette. Say love and mean a man moving through you like water, how he turns undrinkable soon as he leaves your body. I carry much nostalgia for the times I don't remember, the evening ritual of breaking a small kingdom, call from a lost friend full of unfamiliar stories, me and all of them. Those years, I was lonely as a window, even the light refused to pass through. Don't ask me to name the precise strain of terror so elemental it throbbed, how the organs in my stomach became strange to each other, the grope of cement I woke twitching against. Near death is how you tell it. Outside my window, children beat fake animals hanging from the trees with metal bats. I take out the bottle and inside my body, a white door opens into a room full of red-faced men Blood moons, the lot of them. Don't ask me why I kept it. The bottle. I'll lie. Cool. Thank you. Okay, I was doing good on time. How are y'all feeling? One thumb, a yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, feeling, yeah. Um, I think, oh yeah, okay, this will be fun. Since we were already talking about conversion therapy, um, <laughs> there's a series of essays in the book that kind of look like this. You know what I mean? They're like little fragments, um, and they're separated by these double colons, like butt to butt. Um, and so, and I say they're essays because they're like attempts at understanding these like larger antiquated medical diagnoses that I don't understand. And so they're like written in fragments and they don't make any sense. Um, okay. I don't think I've read this one aloud. Let's see how this goes. Um, okay. How about, and, uh, to sort of like mark where they break. Every time I lift my hand, can y'all just like clap? Okay, let's try that one more time. Mm, great, yeah, de definitely don't do it at the same time. <laughs> as, not, as not at the same time as possible. Okay. On conversion therapy. Grandpa's initial response upon learning I was queer was to look to history for all the ways I could be fixed. Hypnosis, group talk, cocaine, bladder washing, electroconvulsive shock therapy, strike nine, chemical and non-chemical castration, rectal massage, bicycling, institutionalization, inducing vomit while looking at homoerotic images, orgasmic reconditioning, cold showers, prayer, satiation therapy, psychotropic medicines, the first endocrinologist experimenting in the field transplanted the testicles of straight men into homosexuals, attempting to hormonally reorder their orientations. Of course, without immunosuppressants, their bodies rejected the unfamiliar organs. All precious stones are made this way through a process of applied heat and pressure. Even now, we know queerness is a kind of possession, the priest replaced by the therapist, the swallow quiet exorcism, 
As a boy, I held a woman for a short time and her body was a rejected organ in my hands. What, what I mean is once I was a boy, of course I tried to take my life into my own hands. Choir of children's Tylenol singing joy to the world. That knife singing an older song, the liquor, the liquor. Family is the mineral vein, and love is the hand that polishes. Who gives a damn about my forgiveness? There's nothing innate in the brain about the objects we lust after. When I, tape, when I attempt to place my tongue on the blood root of desire, it ends up torn out of my mouth. Before the advent of analysis, faggots were either gods or monsters, either ended in jail, in pleasure, in heaven, in flames. How are we doing? Maybe like three more poems, two little ones and a longer one? That feel good? Okay. I feel like sometimes it's just like poem, 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 and then people can't listen. Are you, can you still like hear? Okay. Um, okay, cool. This is, a, this is just like a description of a manic episode. <laughs> it's called Hashtag Mania. There are a bunch of hashtag poems. I'm like trying to make sure everyone knows I'm a millennial. <laughs> like cuss, but millennial. <laughs> Okay, hashtag mania. We're not on speaking terms. I shout curses into the skeletal awnings of payphones. Parking meters vomit coins as I pass. Mad presidents at my feet, embossed in silver and nickel and copper. Sewer grates yawn in the floodwaters. I take my shelter where I can get it. Dance in the streetlights, spotlights, move so quick, even rain can't get me wet. Text everyone, everyone text. Get a few messages back, spread me across the city. Tonight finds us in a man's apartment with a bottle of Old Crow deranged and flapping blackly below my jacket. I take my shelter where I can get it. His face is full of puncture wounds and dead stars shine through him. Tonight, I don't have a father, no matter what this man wants me to call him. When the street greets me after, I'm half calamity and half bitter cream. I am beating the morning forward with the wilderness of my sneakers. I am belting unbearable songs from the penthouse of my lungs. I am watching my father spill out of me all over this city. City's waking radios. Waking radios. <laughs> All right. How am I doing? Okay. Maybe I wait. I gotta find. Most of these are long because one of them's like three minutes. Well, y'all y'all don't need to know. But am I thinking about this? Um. Cool. I feel like uh, you know where like your time's coming to an end, in like a movie, and you're like, oh, I don't want it to end. And then it does. And then you're like, oh, I should have done all these other things. That's what's going on in my head right now. And like wasting your time <laughs> through that process. <laughs> all right, I'm going to do two do, two do or poem. Um, okay, this is, called, this is called Meet. I met a man on um, named Rome on like a cruising app. And then we fucked and it was boring. So I decided to make a poem where he was both Rome, uh, the person in Rome, the holy Roman Empire. All right, it's like a high concept poem. All right. Mm it's called, it's called meat. Rome's got a broken nose. Rome knows the path through the catacombs below Paris. Rome flowers. Rome bath. Rome lolls and laughs at once. Rome's got the same look in all his pictures. Rome promises what will become of my body if I let him in. Says he'll play me like a violin while he burns. Rome talks big shit pretends to be younger than he is, always somewhere exotic, Photoshop's color on his lips. Rome sends pictures of his dick, toppled stone column, Caravaggio limp. Rome shows up on my doorstep after tracking my phone's GPS. Rome's very romantic. <laughs> Basilica filled with spit all traffic inside him. Emojis are Rome's romance language. He types wink angel diamond. He types tongue prayer pig. When I don't reply, he types knife knife skull. <laughs> he types wolf knife toilet. 
Rome throws up small cities on my front steps. Rome lifts his skirt and out falls a plague. Rome scares the neighbors. You can't take Rome anywhere, the neighbors say. The neighbors don't care if Rome dies long as flowers. Inside my apartment, I let Rome inside me. He's fine. Then finished. Then fragments. Well, thank you. Um, how am I doing? Is it okay if I do? I might go like a little over my time. Is it okay or should I end now? Oh, wait, okay, I know, I know, that sucks. All right, um, we'll just have less time to talk after, but I'll be around afterwards. Okay, and Gina ends the, the, a fucking boss, so I can't wait for that reading. Um, this is called to be read aloud at a vigil for the National Endowment for the Arts at Trump Tower on March 15th, 2017. I wrote this poem for a vigil at the National Endowment for the Arts, and it was in March and no one showed up because it was cold. Um, so we just yelled poems at a tower. Um, it was really beautiful. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> it was cold as fuck. I mean, there were like 30 people and it was really beautiful. Thank you. Oh, no. It was a really beautiful gesture. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that I got to hear the work out of it. Oh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> There are several theories that attempt to explain the invention of money, and all of them are dipped in blood. The one that makes the most sense is that money was invented as a system of tracking debt, the movement of goods between men. A man gives another man a horse and in exchange some kind of paper. Aristotle said every object wa has two uses, the purpose for which it was originally designed and the value it has when traded. There are several theories that attempt to explain the invention of written language, and the one that makes the most sense to me is tied to debt, is dipped in blood. A man gives another man a horse, and there it is, alive in ink on paper, is a metaphor you can fold and keep in your pocket. I have several theories that attempt to explain the invention of arts grants, and all of them are tied to debt all tied to the guilt a country inherits facing its history of pillage, tied to facing the impossible horror of your own wealth. A man takes a country, its money, its horses, and expects to be forgiven without giving up shit. And here we are, having to exist in the yuck of it in a world that does not know how to assign a poem its proper horse. I've done all kinds of things for money. Slaying coffee, guarded a fence, taught scansion, and there was this once I sucked dick for $60. I was trying to get to Houston to read poems for an even smaller amount of money in the basement of a punk house. A mouth has two uses, the purpose for which it was originally designed and the value it has when traded. Thus, his hips bucked once and suddenly a full tank of gas. My pockets alive with animals, a metaphor for horsepower. I write about this often, how I hoed for poetry. Later, I received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, for a collection including some writing about sucking that dick, and suddenly the value of my mouth exploded. Hosanna, my currency multiplied, now a government-approved throat. In that same packet, though, an elegy for my dead ex-boyfriend, even though he hated me still, I made his body alive again on paper made it dance for coins, traded his body for sandwiches, for rent. I've got a government-approved sadness. I've got a government-approved debt. I've got a government who wants my loved ones filled with bullets, filling prisons. It's sick how money is always disturbing the dead, always making our lives declare their value against the price of oil, but still, you have to pay to live. My family had to pay to be smuggled out from the burning charnel house of Russia, and this, it's how I'm here. A man Man gives another man a horse who gallops the fuck away. There's an alternative theory of language that suggests it was invented to approach the ineffable, touch God, give shape to what by its nature is priceless. You, alive in my arms again, all my family, blood, or otherwise around the same table, good, clean water. Every poem I have ever written is trying to get closer to the people I have lost and is failing. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was worried about that. I was like, man, really? I'm going back in I have to follow Sam. I'm gonna be all full of tears, and, and here I am. So, you know, but it's a show about mania, and I'm me, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to read, um, 
I'm going to start with poems from Said the Manic to the Muse, and then I'm going to read some newer work, and then we can chat. Um, good girl. Every morning, I sit at the kitchen table over a tall glass of water swallowing pills so my hands won't shake. So my heart won't race, so my face won't thaw, so my blood won't mold, so the voices won't scream, so I don't reach for knives, so I keep out of the oven, so I eat every morsel, so the wine goes bitter, so I remember the laundry, so I remember to call, so I remember the name of each pill, so I remember the name of each sickness, so I keep my hands inside my hands, so the city won't rattle, so I don't weep on the bus, so I don't wander the guardrail, so the flashbacks go quiet, so the insomnia sleeps, so I don't jump at car horns, so I don't jump at cat calls, so I don't jump a bridge, so I don't twitch, so I don't riot, so I don't slit a strange man's throat. This is a poem, it's a persona poem written in the voice of my own mania speaking to me. This is The Mania Speaks. You clumsy bootlegger, little daffodil. I watered you with an ocean and you plucked one little vein downed a couple of bottles of pills and got yourself carted off to the ER. I gifted you the will of gunpowder, a matchstick tongue, and all you managed was a shredded sweater and a police warning. You should be legend by now. Girl in an orange jumpsuit, a headline. I built you from the purest napalm, fed you wine and bourbon, preened you in the dark, hammered lullabies into your thin skull. I wrote the poems, I painted the walls, I shook your goddamn boots. Now you want out? <laughs> Think you'll wrestle me out of you with prescriptions? A good man's good love and some breathing exercises? You think I can't tame that? I always come home. Always. Ravenous, loaded, you know better than anybody. I, I'm bigger than God. So now we know what goes on inside my head. Um, here's a similar poem about the same shit in a, I'm bipolar, and um, I've been to the hospital, and this was a poem that was written after I got out. Tracing wrist scars. I used to keep exquisite potted plants. Now, pots of dirt. My friend Megan keeps pots of dirt, one with a ceramic hand crawling out, another a foot, true story. Funny, the things we covet. I only learned to begin wanting again recently. I don't know where to place my wants, how to justify them or actually obtain. It isn't fair to want things after trying to give everything away. The wine isn't fair, the overpriced penne, paycheck, new boot laces, a night out for music or poetry or beer, this guilt. Wanting a day of sun, or even rain. Things that racket and wail, things that shimmy or, or sit quietly on a windowsill. Shameful, I think, to covet a tattoo or philosophical conversation, a book, a trinket, a new poem, a pulse. A lot of this book is, without going into the whole story, it's um, the triggering event was a loss of a relationship and what that meant for me in terms of um, getting older and not being able to have kids. And so there's a lot of that which is peppered throughout the whole book, but it, um, it very much looks at that year in my life of... Um, 
extreme, e e you know, it started the way that, that mania kind of starts and it's um, the triggering moment. You manage, you manage, you manage, you fall, you manage, you manage, you spike, you know, and that, so the book traces this. It's, it's basically written chronologically. Um, I'm sweating, so I'm going to not do this. I was like, I have color. I can be colorful. Not really. Um, so this is another persona poem uh, that kind of in, in a lot of ways mirrors what I thought of that relationship, that triggering loss. Um, I've never told that before. So uh, the, the actual backstory to this poem is, uh, for those who don't know the, the backstory to Jezebel, uh, she and King Ahab were married, and their marriage was considered politically corrupt. And according to King James Bible, uh, in the Book of Kings, the entire family was executed. King Ahab and their sons were executed by guillotine, but Jezebel was executed by being thrown into a pit of dogs and eaten alive. This is Jezebel Revisits the Book of Kings. I wouldn't go out frayed and bleating, refuse to racket or wail. I was a holy woman of Baal. I faced the end in silk and jewels, posture, purple. For this, my name means whore, means raggedy dance, means black jasmine, means sweat, stamen, ovary, means pearl. In the wet lap of oysters, my name means ruby lip. I lived in a time of men. I lived in the time of Ahab. I am a mother of kings, born of hurricane and pomegranate. Fed on the breast, I was maker of milk. I passed the streams and the night flowers bent to kiss me. I was evoker of hail, windstorm. I prodded the gods and they came, feasted at my table, crowned my husband. Mine is the story of love. Women who survive the hate of men are named harlot, witch, Jezebel. I still hear the dogs. In a different century, they'd have burned me. They'd have pressed my body to the river's floor. I was a burning fish. Silver flakes trailed in my wake. I was silk dance and flutter, maker of tides, of thorns. Girls cowered and men flocked. I led armies on the soft hull of my back, a powerful woman is simply one who has not yet died. Flanked on all sides by men made furious with envy, men gone mad. I did it for Ahab. He came to ball for me. There is nothing I would not do. He wanted the castle. I mortgaged my wrists. He asked for the crown. I slayed the soldiers. He sought a dynasty. I gave him the globe. Nothing less than a man would do. Remember, Helen? I was ear to the prophets, Ahab's wife, mother to Ahaziah and Jehoram, men raised on woman's sugar tit, Venetians with mouths of gold. I was a woman with hunger, prophecy scholars, name me corrupt, name me concubine, hussy, charlatan, tainter of men. My name means wicked, unholy. Ahab? was my only. His tongue, my tongue, his flesh, my flesh. I was a woman in love. They robbed me first of Ahab's breath. Then, my sons. I wasn't thrown into that pit of dogs. I dove. And did I dive? <laughs> Whoo! <laughs> Hospitals are not a great place. Um, so my third book is coming out on Black Lawrence Press in August of next year. I'm very excited. It is titled Prey, P-R-E-Y. It is about sexual and psychological predation. And uh, here's some poems about that. I write about really fun shit, don't I? Um, All 
All right, I'm switching my order here. Um, in light of what's all over the news as well, I think I think this is a good starting jump point. This um, <laughs> this poem opens with an epigraph by Marty McConnell. I wanted to write you a curse song. This is for the woman who loved the predator more than his prey. I would wish on you the knowing, knowing with your own good body, but I am incapable. You are made of flesh and nerve and thought, of heart and love and wonder and grief as I am. Let me wish for you this, a deep sleep, trust in the man at your back who is promised sanctuary and you have sipped of the sanctuary rolled your milk skin in it leaned your eyelashes on his breastplate removed your bones for kindling it to warm his hands and he has drunk of you and you are almost whole in the clumsy wonder of maybe he is the one though he appears a strange divergence from your girlhood imaginings they say this is always true his mouth is filled with the world and he is giving it all to you and you believe. I will not wish for you the bruise, the leap in the throat, the shriek, the shock and scramble in your own flowered sheets, his glazed eyes, the sudden property you have become. You, a scatter of dust beneath a heave of muscle, he culls your pleas into a storm of thrust, grunt, drool. You here cannot move. You are nothing more than your wit and your lungs, and neither seem enough. You are the torn cotton, the wrenched thigh, the perfect stone-colored fingerprints. You are the scrub and the sob, all his countless hands. I do not wish you become the night terrors, the flashbacks, the grief and grief and grief, insomnia, delusion, the disbelief, the holy, 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 holy wreck, the awe and burn. I do not wish you stay. Stay and forgive. I do not wish you forgiveness. Do not wish you cordial, polite. I do not wish you his manipulations or the mind's trickery. I will never wish you liar as you have christened me. I do not wish you answer why or how or show me evidence. I do not wish you silence, shame, whiskey, box cutter, Xanax, do not wish you erase, erase. I do not wish you anything to erase. I do not wish you this, no. I will never wish you this. This also opens with an epigraph. This is from poet Luke Bowerlin. I'm gonna give you the title first and then the epigraph and then I'll jump in. The poem is titled Meditation on a Poem About Glass Embedded in the Scalp After a Car Accident. He writes, you live through all of it, the impact, the moment absorbed in the body. The poet writes about shards, how his body kept them Skin grew over and eventually released the bits back into the world, something foreign and useless, and I am familiar with the effect. Having picked the itchy glass of a Nissan from my own elbow as a child, a full year after the Lincoln sped head on into our lane, and it isn't very different, or different at all, from how I wake at 3.06 a.m. every day, though it has been over three years, and his shadow still rides the length of my body as if it now belongs to me. How my skin took in and grew over his violence and now spits it back out in small fragments each time a man stands too close on the subway. This is not in any book, and it doesn't know what it is. And it's, uh, it's basically a glossary. It's titled The Manic's Dictionary, and it's just a series of definitions. Um, and I think, I wanna close on this, it's a little bit long, um, but I think it, it speaks better to, not better, I think this is all talking about the shit we're supposed to be talking about, but 
Madness and mania. This is the Manics Dictionary. Mood means infinite. Red means burn everything. I have no choice but to open my skin, tooth and raise and birth, menstruation and nipple and cervix and each soft fold of labia, knees raw as rug burn and cherry lipstick on the cock. Mama's favorite Christmas pie. Mars, candle wax drippings on my 13-year-old thighs, the crimson shock of my high school mohawk. When I say I would cut you, I mean I would cut you. Fever and broil and rage so hot my spit sizzles. Got glass under my knuckles. Got everything wrong and only you to blame today. Stand back, duck and cover, buckle your seatbelt, run before I scald you. Careful, lollipop, I am a lightning storm about to touch down. A turbine engine, meteor shower, lava, looking for a city to conquer. My name is kerosene. Come inside me and don't look for the metaphor. I painted my nails the color of blood for you. I painted my apartment the color of blood for you. Leave the animals alone and hunt me. Come for me, I dare you, try me, hiss in all its tongue. Fine means my legs don't work. I, I can't feel my pulse. Gravity exists. The river is calling. The bridge knows my name. I am blade and bullet. I am the pills and the wine. Don't speak. Don't speak. Stop talking. Stop prodding. Just let me go. Hello means, why that quizzical look? Is it something I said? Did I cross you, misspeak, fail you, embarrass you, offend? Do, do I have something in my teeth? Did I forget to flush? Did I do that? Did that thing I did that didn't annoy you secretly annoy you? Am I ignorant, disgusting, rude? Did I speak out of turn? Are you going to leave? Do you think I'm a fraud, hack, liar? Do you think I've got it coming? Do you want me to eat it, suck it, choke on it? Do you wish I were someone else, wish I were gone, wish I were never? Did I scare you, hurt you? Am I too much, not enough? Do you regret me? How long before it's over? Is it over? Hello. Gray means my fingers' hips have gone cold. Who are you? I don't recognize this room or this city or that woman in the mirror. Give me a minute. Shh, I, I got to stare out past your face for a while. I don't know when I'll be back. What was that? Sure. Whatever, sure. I, I like nachos, movies, poetry, puppies, you, but I don't know what it means to like. You're, you're garbled. I'm a league underwater. What's your name again? I have skin. I have toes. I have a toothbrush somewhere. Who, who let you in? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Did you say something? Have, have we met? Wink means, look at my wings. Can't you see I am the pot of gold? I smile every color in the Crayola box. Got a fistful of balloons and a ball gown. I am pretty as a chandelier, ready as a speedway. How many shots can you stomach, cowboy? I need to see Paris now. I need another tattoo now. This handsome maverick I just met on the dance floor better bend me over this pool table now. Catch me if you can. I am aloft, a seabird. Come, be my co-pilot, be my bride, my nectar, my accomplice. Let's set the sea on fire. I shimmer like a disco ball. I am easy as a dive bar. Boots are for licking and men are for kicks. Shoo who fly, I ain't got time to be anything less than magnificent today. Sleep is for the dead. I've got a pocket full of hexes and not enough enemies. Let's move cities. Let's steal a cruise ship. Let's free the circus animals. Take down a tyrant. Let's go. Let's riot. Let's hustle. Let's shake the century. My tail feathers are sparklers. Come, trace these fiery tails into the night. Heart means all of it. Boundless, immeasurable means everything that exists in the history of existence is all right here in the palm of my hand. Look. Thank you. Um, can you hear this? Is this still on? 
Uh, we're going to do a very brief Q&A with mm -hmm. you guys to start, or to end the night. I'm sorry. And I was going to kick it off with a quick question. Um, and I have so many questions, but we'll leave most of them for you. Um, but my initial question is just about your writing process. I'm interested in when you write and if where, if you have a certain place, but also how in the face of you know, and mental health issues, the news cycles, and so much more. Um, just interested in hearing more about the process itself. Sure. Um, well, really, I write any way that I can. It feels like such a difficult thing to find time or space or energy or impact uh, or import. So like, if I have an idea, I'll bring paper with me, um, or write it into my phone, or talk to myself until it's in my head. Um, or if I have an hour, I'll sit down and try to make a poem. Um, often I'll just take something I don't understand that the world offers me, that my body responds to in terror or joy or uh, desire or disgust. Um, and then I'll try to find language for it. And if I don't have language for it, that'll become a poem. And like the poem is a way of sort of seeking that sort of disjuncture between uh, the like strange awfulness of the world and like the, the failings of language. And so I think poetry for me is sort of like offers that mediation between the terror and horribleness <laughs> of the world and, uh, you know, an embodied experience that uh, wants to have uh, like approximate joy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, um, in terms of physically how, where, when I write, I have a day job at a desk at a bank. It's very embarrassing to confess that truth. And a lot of what I get done during the day is to have that alt tab toggle switch that if anyone walks nearby, I just toggle out of that poem. And then when they're gone, I go right back to that poem <laughs> and I sneak a shitload of writing into my day job. I hope to God no one from my job is here. <laughs> I fail to look at every face, sorry. Um, <laughs> kidding, I don't really do that, no. <laughs> uh, and this, it, but I also, I keep a notebook with me at all times. I have finally moved into this century and I do send notes to myself via text or something. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't have the get up every morning and write for this amount of time and any of that kind of stuff. Um, what, in terms of what compels me to write, uh, similarly, I f have found since I, I've been writing since I was very, very young and it, what it did for me was helped me unpack all the shit in my life and all the shit in the world. And I, I get very nervous about things like this where I have to just answer on the fly where I can't sit with my paper and plan out exactly what it is I believe and say it correctly and not curse a lot. And it, it, so writing as a, as a tool to process how I live and how I get through each day and how I navigate my own mental health and also navigate this terrifying sphere of what we do, it, um, what we survive every day as citizens of the world. Um, and so I have to write. If I'm feeling something, I am actually physically compelled to write about it. It's not necessarily something anyone's ever going to read, but it's something that helps my brain unpack it and, and make sense of it for myself. Mm. So that's that process. Hi. Um, my question's about performance, actually, and how you guys might think about um, cadence or um, voice. I know that sometimes it's very easy to maybe think that you have like your poetry voice um, and that you like, you know, how do you, do you think about every poem sounding different or are you, are you sometimes gonna go into a poem and think I, I'm just going to very comfortably slide into my typical poetry rhythm and um, you know, what is your thought process with that? I, I studied theater mm. and so I do have a very much a performative background and I, firmly believe that, particularly with poetry, 
and poetry audiences, people who have an appetite for this very small, giant, but small art form that we do, um, you only get to hear it once. Now, if we're lucky mm. and we're published and people w have the change in their pocket to buy the book, then you can revisit that and mm. I can trust that my work, I work very hard on the page to make, make it make sense when you're home with it. Mm. But I also recognize that right here, right now, you only get to hear Sam once and you only get to mm. hear me once um, in this moment, in this live moment where we're all in this mm. together. And it's really important to me to convey that poem in a way that that y you don't have time to sit with it at home and let it impact you. I have to do that work. That's mm. my responsibility here. And so in terms of cadence and that kind of thing, I have worked very hard to not have one. I have worked very hard to not have a poetry voice. And yet Jezebel is definitely not how I roll. Like I don't walk around <laughs> talking about, you know, I am pomegranate, right? Like it's just not how I speak. Mm. I curse a lot more than that. But <laughs> so t I fight against the poetry voice, but it does mm. it's does find its way. Um, specifically, though, in terms of what I do want to bring to every every time I'm reading aloud for other people's ears, mm. I want to do what the poem wants me to do. I want to give it that attention so that you can walk away feeling something. That's what I want. I want you and I to have an emotional experience together. So I, that's where the work, that's the work I try to put into the performance. So yes, I do rehearse and I do do that work. I love that. Yeah, that's most of it, I have to say too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, I've, I guess I've been like performing poems for like a decade. Um, and I think there was a time when I would like drill a three minute poem for like six months with a group of people. Um, I don't do that anymore because I don't have as many friends. Um, but I think like, I guess I'm most interested in the sort of authenticity of the spoken gesture, you know, to be as like as true to the, the poem as I can be. Or like if I'm talking to y'all in a space, I don't want to like have it be like, I want like I understand it's a performance, but I also want to like acknowledge that we're all in this room together and I'm reading y'all a poem. So I think at its best, I'm like embodying the poem and speaking to you, audience and individual people. Um, yeah, I also think thinking about like what what drove me to wrote, write the poem and sort of embody that moment about like what it was that caused me to like to make this piece of writing about you know this manic episode or to make this piece of writing about some type of horror you know, that I experience in my life with pleasure. And then like when I perform that, it's like if I do that without the sort of like emotional grounding that caused me to write the poem, then it tends to feel a bit inauthentic as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think everyone who reads poems should have like some like basic ass performance training though. Um, Cause otherwise poetry readings are hella boring, you know, and you have to do so much work to cut through like someone's inability to to perform their own poems. I mean, I don't know, Kyle's an amazing performer of his work and I don't know if, I don't think you come from a performance background. Um, and so I think it's just like finding those particular, like, you know, there are a lot of writers who don't slam and who don't, you know, do theater, who are able to like sell their work. I just was uh, did a reading with Chen Chen, who's like amazing. And he's just very like authentic to the reading and just wants to perform the poem, um, but also not be disingenuous. And I'm rambling in response, but thank you for your question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mirta. I'm a writer from Holland, and at the this moment, I'm staying at the mental hospital at the Kings County for a residency for four months. And actually, today we were talking about because um, there's a lot of writing going on at the at the group where I work. And then uh, today we were talking about writing during like a manic episode and how you judge that. Um, and then I was wondering, like, asking you guys, how have you written a lot during like an, a manic period and how did you read that later is it among your best writing or uh, or well maybe it's not a really clear question is it sort of okay Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to hear about this residency. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you all about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> and maybe like get on it. Um, that sounds dope. Um, yeah, I think I approach that in like any 
the way I um, write from any like heightened sort of state or like altered state. Um, and it's like, as if I can write, if I can get anything on paper, I'll do it, and then I like come back to it like a, a week later. Um, I don't think there's any like sort of static answer from whenever I'm writing in like either a manic state or like uh, just being like very doomsday or like in a super depressive episode. Um, I feel like all of it feels like sort of like genuine to my sort of embodied ex from in my experience, and so like if I can write it down and then return to it and craft it later, that's sort of how I go about that process. That's actually quite similar to what I was going to say. Um, I would say I, I can go back over my body of work and look at the poems that are that have very like palpable momentum and urgency in them. Um, I know very specifically the ones that I wrote, like its bones were put down on paper during a manic episode. And then I do the same thing. I don't trust it. I don't, I'm not someone who I edit a extensively and so I, I don't, it's not that I, I wrote it in this state and it needs to live in that space and I'm not that kind of writer. I definitely go back through and say, okay, well, let's cut half of these things because that they, the reader's not even going to care. Like you care, Jeanne, but the reader's not going to care. So I, I do go back to the poem and make it, you know, tighten it and, and, and make it tell the story that needs to be told, but I can still tell from afar, even after editing, the pieces that were written in various mental states. Um, and a lot of that has to do with momentum. I can, I can just feel it when I read it on the page silently. Same. Thank you. Um, my name's Emma. I'm also a writer with mental illness. Um, and I feel like I sometimes fall into this trap of like, if I'm healthy, then I won't have anything to write about. And I'm wondering if that's like a question that you guys have grappled with and kind of how you've thought about that question. Mm. I used to. Um, when I was younger and, and still very much in argument with myself as to whether or not I accepted the idea th or the diagnoses, um, you know, I... I think many of us go through phases where we're, you know, I'm fine. <laughs> Take your diagnosis and shove it, right? And then do something a little bit off kilter and then go, oh, shit, maybe that's, okay, maybe I should take these pills. Okay. Um, w most of us who live with mental health things go through that and many, many times. So when I was much, much younger, I thought I was boring when I wasn't, manic and I thought I was boring when I wasn't depressive because even though I'm not fun to be around and I don't even want to be outdoors, I don't want to talk to people when I'm in that state, I also know that I'm feeling things so immensely that it's interesting. So that normal normalcy, which I'm phrase I cannot stand, but I'm <laughs> using it for the purpose of this dialogue, is it felt boring and um, uh, that is something that I've battled over the years, but I definitely shed it after enough of these peaks and valleys and enough of these like really erratic, uh, my, my mania tends to manifest in rage, and so after enough really, really outlandish violences, I recognize that, nope, I'm never boring. Mm. I will always have something to tell you. <laughs> I will <laughs> always have a story, <laughs> and maybe I should peel the, reel those back in a little bit. Yeah, that da that thinking for me has been really dangerous in my life. Um, and I think it's part of like a sort of cultural construction of how we think of the artist as well, right? There's like this sort of romanticism around like a person who destroys themselves or like revels in, um, yeah, revels in that. And so I don't know, I was like drinking like a bunch of cough syrup and like screaming at strangers. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's interesting. But I also don't think the poems that were coming out of that particular point in my life were that... I mean, I'm glad to have gone through it, and I'm, like, appreciative of everything in my life. Um, but I think there's, like, also value in stasis, also value in joy and writing into joy and, like, the sort of muted joy that can come. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think, like, TBH, I think, it, like, anything that gets the poems out 
unless it harms anyone is all right, but it's dangerous thinking. Thank you. We've got time for one more small question. If anyone has one, here we go. When you appear at events like this and you read your poem and you perform, do you feel almost like it's a cathartic experience or do you feel like you're on stuck in your kind of like own personal groundhog day where you keep reliving the same experiences over and over again? Um, no, not cathartic. Um, I look at it as a job. I'm here to, not a job that I hate, it's a job that I love. It's the job I would love to do all the time. Mm. But it is like, I come here with a responsibility to you mm. to engage you, to hopefully, like I said a minute ago, get some emotional connection between us mm. as two human beings. Um, so I do take a lot of responsibility when I come. And so I'm very nervous and I'm very scattered and I have to always like kind of take a minute in the back and get my head screwed on straight and not just, you know, I, I get nervous and jittery. And in terms of the latter part of your question, it's, you use the term authenticity, which is to me the most important thing about this. It's not, um, my theater professor used to talk about masturbating on stage, not actually masturbating on stage, but that some people who write and perform their own work um, do it just because they, they, there's some compulsion in them that they need to reveal to a room of people mm -hmm. what they've gone through. Um, and I have battled that a lot in my life. That's a very self-loathing thing, I think, to, to, to put on myself. And I battled it a lot. And then I am lucky enough to do this enough that I'll have someone come up to me after a reading and say, I never knew how to say that. And I needed you tonight to say it. I needed to hear it from someone because I wasn't able to do it. And that's helped me get through that what could be perceived as that, you know, masturbating on stage, that it's all about me and me, 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 me. It's, it's actually, I do have stories to share that, that are helping someone else see themselves. And I, it has actually helped me continue doing the work that I do because it would be very easy to get so mad at myself and be so embarrassed or ashamed that I would shut down. So... I choose not to. Yeah. Um, dang, your answers are so good. Um, I don't really trust catharsis, I don't think, um, in the sort of like Brechtian sense that like it's permission to like get rid, um, like you have the experience and then you're like over it. And I think for me, I'm more interested in this, yeah, that sort of like sort of shared moment with a uh, readership, which is really why I like, um, like blasphemy and uh, just being filthy and like sort of having that sort of like shared, shared moment with somebody. Um, I think in the in the the first moments of reading a poem when it's like mad new and it feels like there's like a kind of urgency to it. Um, well, I, all the poems have urgency, but like specifically like elegiac poems or like poems of outrage in their first like couple readings um, have a different kind of energy. And then, yeah. I think it's different in every room, and a poem has a new life in every room I read it in. Um, and like the sort of interaction and relationship with an audience alters the text in a way that makes it new each time, which I think is one of the most beautiful things about the sort of oral tradition and reading poems aloud. And it's what brought me to poetry, right? Is to come to a reading and see somebody have this like authentic, transcendent relationship with a piece of writing. Um, and it sort of feels like casting spells, mm -hmm. and they exist, and then they disappear, mm -hmm. and then here we are. Um, and I just want to thank everyone really quickly once more for coming. Their books are for sale. Please buy a copy, get it signed, hang out and chat for a little bit. And another huge round of applause, please, for Sam and Dina. Thank you all for coming.